Hi, this is Sobhan Bharti and we are here at KubeCon and Cloudative Con in Shanghai, China. And today we have with us Priyanka Sharma. Uh, tell us, what do you do at GitLab? Hi, Swapnil. Thank you for having me. Um, I work at GitLab, as you said, and I am the director of Cloud Native Alliances. I have a very interesting role where I focus on our partnerships, technology partnerships with uh, anyone in the cloud native ecosystem. So it could be a cloud provider or, or a startup. I'm actually leading our serverless efforts and working with a company called Trigger Mesh on that. So I have a wide range in the partners itself. And then a part of my job is to focus on our cloud native ecosystem and look at the trends and share my knowledge and expertise that I may be able to, to bring to the community. So it's a two-pronged job. Yeah, and you have an interesting role, but your role also has a term called cloud native. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's uh, depending on who you talk to, different people have different. Uh, <laughs> so what is cloud native according to you? Sure, great question. So in my opinion, uh, cloud native, the concept really started with the concept of cloud computing, where we um, people were suddenly able to put workloads in someone else's data centers and it being managed by someone else. It started with AWS and then Azure and GCP came along. Um, with that, that shift, that fundamental shift, people were just able to build software differently. And uh, technologies that help with that are cloud native technologies. Kubernetes enabled this whole process, and I think of it as the father or mother, parent, parent, gender neutral. Right. It's the parent of the cloud native landscape today, uh, but I think the true beginnings are when cloud computing came about. But also as we, uh, by we I mean industry move or community moves to, our, to embark on their cloud native journey, there are so many struggles, there are so many challenges, yes. there are so many tools, there are so many tool chains, there are so many toolkits. So what are some of the big challenges and uh, how do you, because I look, saw your keynote also yesterday where you talked about objectivity, right? Observ uh, observability. observability. So, so let's talk about uh, the challenges uh, and what are those challenges are technical mostly. I yes. won't go into the human challenges for now. Sure, so sure. can we talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So as I was saying, with the advent of Kubernetes, we could build software differently so it could be shipped faster and more reliably, which is essential for any business mm -hmm. that is trying to compete in today's landscape, right? So that's all good. Um, what that meant was people started building on services and services got smaller and smaller and systems got more fragmented and more complex. So that's a big challenge that people were suddenly facing, not just because this looked different from a large box like monolith that we were all used to, frankly, but also because the kind of tooling that you need to support a really fragmented complex system is different from what you would use for a monolith, right? And that art had been largely, I wouldn't say perfected, but we were all feeling very comfortable in that, in the monolith world. So now that we were in this fragmented system and we needed tooling, I see the last year or two as an explosion of all sorts of options, whether it's in observability, whether it's in CICD, whether it's in security, et cetera, all enabled by Kubernetes. And you just had to go to a KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, and look at the sponsor booths. And it was, it was crazy, right? The number of companies that were there. And often they, it was a little hard to distinguish one from the other. Right. And that to me felt like this is a bubble, a little bit, a little bit. Um, and in that bubble, what I noticed, this is all my personal opinion, what I noticed was smaller teams building my, and shipping microservices, those smaller teams themselves making the choose, uh, sorry, choosing which tooling they wanted to use and then going with it. Great for empowerment, great for moving quickly. Now in, those, in the years that, in these last two years, as people have done that more and more, things are coming to a head on an organizational level. So what is happening is with more microservices came more projects, came more teams, came more different kinds of tooling all within one company. And suddenly they are kind of in the tool chain crisis because they're paying the price of having to acquire all these different types of tools. And anyone who's worked with procurement knows how hard that is. Then they're paying the cost of integrating and every team's doing it. And if you start to choose one over the other, then you have to go through the process again at a larger level. And then finally, people are just context switching between so many different tools that at, at a macro, it, in a micro level, it may not matter, but at a macro level, when you look at an enterprise with like 6,000 developers, a two second context switch costs you three hours. That's just one context switch. So imagine how many there are in a day. So we kind of overdid it, I feel like, in terms of like the plethora of choices and the different things we were choosing. Um, 
So that's kind of thing I, where I think we stand today. And I know I'm not the only one thinking this. I've heard, I talk to a lot of enterprise customers being at GitLab. And I also have a lot of friends in this community here. And we're all starting to talk now about, well, the individual gains are costing company losses, right? So how do we find a middle ground where we empower our teams and individuals, but at the same time have some layer of sanity, let's just call it that, for the entire organization, where people can see what's happening across projects, so there's visibility, there's efficiency, so people can jump in and collaborate as necessary rather than being like, oh, I'm here, I can't collaborate with that person, they just use different tools and I don't know what they do. And then finally, there's some governance, which makes you know the security people and the CIOs sleep better at night, so that because it's all organized across the organization. That's the big need of the hour now. Uh, the good news is Kubernetes community itself has, you know, kind of self-regulated themselves. Exactly. Ensure. But how do you see the ecosystem around Kubernetes? Uh, do you see some consolidation happens as companies realize that, okay, there is only so much? Because right now, everybody is embarking on that cloud native journey, so there's Huge Every emergency. individual yes, is embarking yes. on the journey yes, rather yes, than company yeah. even. Yeah. So just like there's a dot-com boom, there's like right now Kubernetes, you know, <laughs> boom. That's so true. Yeah, uh, but there will be a point where companies will, set, uh, not saturate, but you know, maturity will be there, stabilization will be there. Exactly. And all this will go away. So how do you see, in which direction do you see consolidation? I think consolidation is definitely happening. And um, like the service meshes are doing this. Uh, Envoy, as you know, bakes in a bunch of observability. I said this in my keynote yesterday and I'll say it again today. Things like that provide a really good platform where you can standardize. Like every service will have this amount of tracing or these this kind of metrics, right? But then allowing some flexibility for people, uh, for engineers to go in and be like, that breadth of coverage is great, but now I what I really care about is making sure this particular transaction is basically like latency free. So then they need to have that flexibility to like dig deeper and in use tooling that will help them get extra info. That should, that's fine, but like having that layer of consistency helps a lot. And I think, and yes, people are doing that everywhere. Right. And now when you're not uh, uh, paying attention to what the community is doing and where we are heading, what do you do in the free time? What are your hobbies? Don't tell me that your work is your hobby. <laughs> You know, we discussed remote work, right? And that does tend to seep. But I read a lot. I, uh, I con make a conscious effort to have one fiction book and one um, sort of business or like, like non-fiction of any kind book going in parallel. Usually the business book is on Audible and the fiction is on Kindle. Awesome. Thank you, Priyanka, so much for talking to us today. And hopefully uh, we will see... Uh you again at the next KubeCon, and we'll hear more about what GitLab is up to. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.